valley, you know, to, to understand even that what God is doing in the valley and those valley experiences is when God is, is, is working on your faith. He's working on your character. That's where that stuff needs to show up. That's where we grow the most is in the valley, not in the mountain. So I don't know what you're going through if you're in a valley today, but can I, can I just like remind you that if you are in a valley, listen, God is with you. That he is not forsaking you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll go with me. He said, you lead me beside still waters. Come on, let's pray. God, we just thank you right now. And we choose to trust you, God, not in our circumstances. We don't put our trust in our timing. We don't put our trust in our ability. God, we choose to trust you no matter the situation, whether I'm on the mountain or in the valley. God, you are God alone, and I choose to trust you for my breakthrough. I choose to trust you for your timing and the miracle, God. God, I pray that you would open our hearts to receive from you, God, that we come today with an expectation and anticipation that we're, we're going to be changed by your presence. We're going to be challenged by your presence. God, don't let us leave here the same. Touch our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, guys. Let's worship God. Give us some praise. Come on. It's, it's easy to be faithful when things are good. It's easy. Let me, say, let me say it this way. It's easy to begin something, but to continue in that thing is a whole different story. And actually, faith really isn't faith until it's tested. Faithfulness isn't really faithfulness until it's been tested. Today, I, I want to talk to you about faithfulness. I want to talk to you about the keep on keeping on that needs to happen. Look what Jesus says in Luke chapter 18, verse 8. He says, when I, the son of man, return, how many will I find on earth who still have faith? I mean, I'm going away for a little bit, but when I come back, are they still going to believe? Are they still going to have faith, faithfulness? Uh, several weeks ago, I think about three, four weeks ago, my wife and I attended a 50-year wedding anniversary. It was so inspiring. It really was. It was moving. I even moved us to tears a couple of times. And just to see the, the life and the impact that they had, there was like 120 people that were there, their kids, the people that just have grown to love them and know them. And it was just amazing. And they kind of shared some wisdom as well, which I loved. I loved hearing from their, their life and wisdom that they had. And they're believers. And so there was just a breadth of wisdom that was there. Um, at one point, the, the husband got on his knee and he proposed again to his wife, and he gave her a big old fat rock, man, a big old, man, it was big, bro, I was like, bro, you're messing all of us up here, okay, you're like, come on, man, dial it, dial it back, no, but, but she, she, uh, the woman, she just, you know, she took it, and thank you, and she, you know, told, and everyone standing there, she, like, took off her, her ring, a current ring, and she said, this is actually not my wedding ring, it's my 25-year anniversary ring, which was a huge rock as well, this one was bigger rock, and, and she said, she said, this here represents, uh, she said, this here represents the struggle, the 25 year. She said, this represents the, whoo, the, we made it. We, uh, we did it. You know, like, like it was an accomplishment. We, it was the raising of the kids. It was the figuring out of the career. It was the transitions and changes of life. It was the, oh, we're standing. We got here. That was like the, the victory of that. That's what it represented was a, was a struggle, was a, all right. But, but she said, but this one, she held up the 50 rock, the 50 year of my hearing. And she said, this represents the sweetness of our love. And she said, it, it, it has just been so beautiful. And I, di I didn't know that there was even a love like this that has been made available to us and that we've been able to experience. But, as she said, I wouldn't have known the sweetness of this love if I hadn't endured through the first 25. And, and it just was so ministered to me about faithfulness. She began to just, just kind of tell some stories of how many times that they could have given up. They could have, they, they could have but they chose to forgive. They chose to love. They chose, to, they chose their covenant and their commitment over convenience. And, and where even advice that they were given was sometimes like it's not going to make it. But it was so beautiful, this picture of 
faithfulness and the legacy and the impact of faithfulness and steadfast commitment and what they were able to accomplish with 50 years and what God was able to accomplish in them was so beautiful, was so moving and inspiring. I even look back at my own life, my in comparison, very short life. But I look back as when I first started in ministry. And, and I had ministry friends that started with me. And it was, you know, as I, and I look now at, at this, all these friends that, that I have. And still in my life, they're still, they're still connected. If I could categorize them into two groups, one of them being those who are still serving God faithfully and the others who are not, for whatever reason. They're just, they're not. Okay, they're just not in church, they're not in Christ, whatever, they're just not serving God faithfully. And it's, it's, not because, it's not because this group here had more trial, had more trauma or crises or difficulty. No, because this group over here, we suffered. We endured. We, we, we had to undergo the same fiery trials. The only difference, I promise you, the only difference as I look at my friends is faithfulness. That's it. It's not that, you know, anyone was smarter or stronger or I, I had many opportunities to quit. <laughs> I, had many, uh, I, just, I just kept dusting myself off and moving forward. Faithfulness, you guys, is the key that I want to speak to you about today. I want to give you three truths about faithfulness that we just need to understand and that I hope that you understand. I want you to understand as you're entering into this new season. And then I want to show you how God will test your faithfulness. It's coming. He's going to test that faithfulness. It's going to happen this season. Take some notes from you guys. Here's some truths that I just want you to understand as we begin a new chapter and a new season. Number one, God is looking for faithful people. He's looking for faithful people, like physically, actively, the Bible says God is looking for people he can bless. And what's he looking for? You know what he's looking for? Faith. That's it. Look what 2 Chronicles 6, 16, 9 says. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to, look at this, to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I mean, God's not looking. Look, some, some people don't. They don't. They're not faithful because they say things. They have excuses like, I'm not strong enough. Well, I'm not ready. Well, I'm not, I, 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 they, whatever excuse, I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough, I don't have enough gifts, I don't have enough talent, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough energy. And God is saying, look, if you just would fully commit to me, I'll give you the strength you need to do what I've called you to do. You don't need the strength, you don't need the capacity, you don't need the know-how or the knowledge, all you need is the full commitment. And God says, I will strengthen you. He's looking for people that will, that are just, if you will get yourself usable, God will wear you out. Okay? He's, he wants to, to bless you. He just is looking for some people that are blessable. You, want, you need to get blessable. Here's number two. The second thing we need to understand, the truth we need to understand about faithfulness, is that faithful people are hard to find. They are, aren't they? They're actually quite rare in life to find a truly faithful person who's faithful to God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Truly faithful. Proverbs 20 and 6 says, Everyone talks about how faithful he is. I found out, really, that, that those who talk the most are the ones who fall off the quickest, man. Right? Isn't that right? Just tuck that away. I don't know. Put that in your pocket or something. I'm just something I've seen. All right? Uh, everyone who talks about how faithful he is, they talk about it, but it's difficult to find someone who really is. A lot of people talk the talk that they trust God, but they really trust their credit card. You know, people say they trust God, but are they going to trust them in their, with their health when it isn't the picture you thought? Trust you with, do we trust him with our relationships? Do we really trust him with our finances? Faithful people are hard to find. Look at Psalm 53. It says, God looks down from heaven at the children of man to see if a single one is wise and one seeks God. But all have proven faithless. All have been corrupted and not one of them always does right. Faithful people are hard to find. That's all I'm saying there. God is looking for people to bless, but he just can't find some, anyone that's blessable. And if you just posture yourself, if you'll just be faithful, it, it, God will find you and say, ah, ha, there's someone I can bless. He's looking for faithful people. They're hard to find. Here's the, the third truth, and this is the reason why I, I'm doing this message today, because faithfulness is the key to victory and blessing. Faithfulness is the key 
to victory and blessing. It's, great. it's good that you started some things, and some of you picked up on some things. You, it's good that you started reading your Bible in this season. It's good that you started prayer and maybe going to church and all that stuff, but it's faithfulness. Continuing is the key to victory and blessing. That's how you're going to overcome problems and the trials, not by your intelligence, you know, not by your creativity, not through your money, not any of those things, but it's by your faith. First John chapter 5, the enemy's distracting us today. Come on now, somebody, turn off them cell phones. I love you though, okay. First John chapter 5, every child of God can defeat the world, and it is what? Our faith that gives us the victory. Time out right there. Did you hear that? God says, if you're, a child, if you're my child, you have what it takes to be victorious. You can defeat the world. And how do you do that? By your faith. Not your, not your strength. Not because you worked harder. Not because you tried more or read more. No, don't get me wrong. Work hard. Hustle. Learn. But that's not going to get you the victory. Faithfulness is the key to victory and blessing. No one can defeat the world without having faith in Jesus as the Son of God. Proverbs 28 and 20 says, A faithful man will be richly blessed. And as your pastor, I want to see you richly blessed. Like in every way, I pray for you to be richly blessed. Physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. In every way, I want, you, I want to see you richly blessed. But in order to have this type of blessing, please listen, you got to learn faithfulness. You have to. There's no short, there's no, there's no way around this. We have to learn faithfulness. You may not like this about God, but, or even know this about God, but he is actively, even like right now, like he's actively trying to test and grow your faith. I don't really like it about it. It's not my, it's not the trait I like about God that he tests us like this to build our faith and to grow us, but he absolutely, he does. And he's not, he's not trying to shut you out of blessing. He's trying to set you up for blessing. And I want you to see it, church. I want you to, to start to see these things. He's trying to set you up. Let me show you in the Bible a story here in John chapter 6 um, that really depicts it very clearly. One of the most famous stories in the Bible. Those people who don't even, you may be here today, you're not like used to the Bible or even church, but you probably heard of this story. It's one of the most famous ones, the feeding of the 5,000, right? The loaves and the fishes. Everyone hear about the loaves and the fishes, that story in the Bible? Most people have heard about that. John chapter 6 Something popped out at me at this story I want to teach on today. It says, sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up to a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? But he asked this only to test him. You see that? For he already had in mind what he was going to do. I read that recently and I thought, that's messed up, Jesus. <laughs> Why are you messing with Philip like that, Jesus? Come on, man. That's honestly, I, I thought, I was like, man, Jesus is punking Philip. Anyone ever get punked before? Anyone, this is, or anyone ever, had, everyone, anyone ever been set up? Like they just like maybe a, a party, uh, a surprise party or something. This here, I'm calling today's, the, the title of the message today is, is Divine Setups. God is actively moving in your life and he is bringing some divine setups. And look, he's not doing this to Philip because he's picking on him. Which, like, come on, like, out of all the 12, why Philip? I feel sorry for the guy, man. He's just, he gave him, like, an impossible situation, but only to test him. See, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to pick on him. He wasn't trying to shut him out of the blessing. He was trying to set him up for a blessing. So what looked like, oh, man, you picked me out. No, God actually picked him for, for, for a blessing. He was going to reveal something, okay? So, so it's not, it's, this is the reason why God brings divine setups. Write it down in your notes. That God uses divine setups to accelerate our growth and expand our thinking. 
See, that's why, that's why the setup comes. That's why the testing comes. Because God wants to, he's trying to accelerate something in your life to grow you to another level to do what he needs to do in you in this season. He's trying to get you thinking differently, that we're thinking from a different perspective. We're thinking, we're seeing the situation wrong, and he wants to expand your thinking. He's trying to accelerate your growth and expand your, th- your thinking through this divine setup. And I don't like it either. I don't like divine setups. Divine setups usually come, and they, they come disguised. They, they look like problems. They come, they're frustrating. They're difficult. It's a trial. It's stressful. It's usually impossible. That's, and it's a setup. I'm just I'm trying to help you guys to see that, that you know what? In the past, in the past, we, we, we've got these tests and these divine setups, and we ran from it. We, we quit on that job. We ran from that relationship. We, we left that church. We, 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 we retreated. And, and this, time, this time, someone say this time. This time, church, we're going to recognize it for what it is. It's a divine setup. This time, church, we're going to be faithful. And, I'm t- and then what's going to happen? God's going to accelerate your growth. He's going to expand your thinking. The reason for the test, look, I, want, I just want you to see them differently, church, because it's coming. It's coming. The tests are coming. It's a divine setup. And because you're not seeing them as a divine setup, you're not responding to them with the right heart. And God's, actually, God's in that. That which you're fighting against, that which you're running against, God's actually in that. It's a test of faithfulness. So there's four areas that I want to show you today that God is testing. Like he's going he's gonna to set you up. This season, it's coming. And there's, honestly, there's a lot of divine setups. And it's very unique to our life. God will set us up differently in different situations and seasons. All right? But these four that I chose, these are like universal setups. Okay? These are universal tests. Every one of us are tested with these. And I believe every one of us are even. They come so frequently. It's going to happen this season. The test is coming. Hey, your faith really isn't faith until it's tested. Faithfulness really isn't faithfulness until the test comes, until it's proven faithful. The test is coming. God's in it, though. He's trying to accelerate your growth. He's trying to expand your thinking. Let me give you four of the tests that are coming your way, church. Write them down. Number one, here's the first test that God is, he uses little things to test my integrity. He uses the little things. It's the things that we overlook. It's the things that seem insignificant. They seem small. We often think it's the big things in life that make someone a success. It's the big things in life that make them a leader. No, 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 no. Yet the big things reveal leadership. The big things in life reveal success. But, but actually, leadership was one in the little things. That, that it was, it, success was developed in the little things, in the stuff that nobody sees. People see the success of Discovery Church, and they go, oh, let me... How do we do that? I talk to pastors all the time. We give our resources, by the way. We give it away. Like, here, try this, try this, and we help them out. But what they don't see is, is what's behind, is the little things that make discovery what discovery is. I mean, that we have, some, they see, you see, and by the way, when you come in, you see the, you see the, this part. You don't see the behind, the little things, the day in, day out, the, the consistency that makes discovery excellent in the ways that discovery is excellent. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we're not, we don't. We're not perfect by any means. But, but people like to think that the big things, no, 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 no. God's in the little things. He's testing you in the little things. That's where your character is developed. That's where your integrity is developed. Luke 16, 10 says, Whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. And whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. So here it is. Your, your public blessing is determined by your private integrity. All right? Your public, your public blessing is determined by your private integrity. You ever hear, every time a politician is involved in some type of scandal, uh, you'll hear someone say, every time you hear someone say, well, that, that doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter what their private life, what they do in their private life, you know, what, what's going to happen in their leadership life. You ever hear that? Anytime a politician does something, can I tell you something? It has everything to matter. Everything. Because, because if a leader, I don't care, politics aside, take your politi- political mind. Sorry for using that. Take your political mind out of it. Any leader who is going to cheat on his best friend, 
But he said, till death do us part, our promise will cheat on you. I promise. It, be, why? Because it's the little things. It's, it, my public blessing is determined by my private integrity, my private character. Not only that, but notice this next verse, Luke 16, 12. He says, and if, if you have not been faithful with that which belongs to someone else, who's going to give you what belongs to you? You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about the concept of apprenticeship. That's what he's talking about. For centuries, if you wanted to do something in life, you wanted to become something, you, you would become an apprentice. So if you want, want to become a shoemaker, you, you're an apprentice under a shoemaker. If you want to become a mechanic, you'd apprentice under a mechanic. The problem nowadays is people are starting things that they have no idea how to do, and they're getting themselves in a, in a, into a lot of trouble. He says, before you get your own, you need to serve in somebody else's. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, if you're not faithful with that, with someone else's job, you won't be faithful with your own. God often in, will entrust you with something of someone else's before he gives it to yourself. God uses those little things where you say, well, that's not my responsibility. Eh, that's not, it's, not, it's not my business. It's not, eh, it's not, that's not my position. That's not my role. That's theirs. It, God, that's, God's using those little things to test your character. I'm telling you, it's a setup. So when someone asks you, hey, shouldn't we do something? Uh, wh what about that? And you go, ain't my job. That was a setup. That was a setup that you failed. God's using the little things to test your integrity, church. It's coming. I'm just telling you, it's coming. It's in the little things. Here's the second test. It's a setup. It's coming. Here's number two. God uses my talents to test my unselfishness. He uses my talents to test my unselfishness. And you're just going to have to decide, church, who you're going to live for. You're either, you're either going to live for yourself, live a self-centered life, or you're going to live for something greater than yourself. You're going to live for Jesus. Listen, faithful people do not live for themselves. They don't live for themselves. Faithful people realize that their talents are not for their benefit. I'm sorry to tell you, but th those talents you have, those talents you have, they're not yours. They're not. They're not yours. They weren't given to you to make yourself money. They weren't given to you to prop yourself up and to promote yourself. They were actually given to you for other people's benefit. That's why God gave it to you. One of my talents is teaching. God didn't, he gave me the ability to teach, not for my benefit. It's for your benefit. Just like God gave you some abilities and talents. Whose benefit was it? For you? No, that was for me, man. <laughs> That's for us. That's why God gave it for us. Faithful people recognize that. They're stewards. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 actually says, Each one should use whatever gift, whatever talent he's received to do what? To serve others. It's not for you. That wasn't for you. It's to serve others. Faithfully administering. There's that word again. Not just serving when it's convenient. Not just serving when you have the time. Not just serving when you have the energy. Faithfully administering God's grace in all the various forms that he gives us grace and talents. One of the principles that we've learned about talents is that if you don't use it, you'll lose it. You will. Right? Isn't that right? You don't, if you don't use your talent, it just kind of goes dull, right? It's like a muscle. The more you use that talent, the more it grows. The, the more you, you don't use it, 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 it not, only, not only will you lose it, God will take it from you and give it to someone else. That'll be faithful. He will. I'm telling you, he will. He um, will. But we also need to understand this principle. Whatever I use wisely, God will give me more of. Whatever I use wisely, God will give me more of. If you use your time wisely, listen, God will give you more time. If you use your energy wisely, God will give you more energy. If you use your influence wisely, God will give you more influence. If you use your, your talent wisely, God will give you more talent. If you use your money wisely, God will give you more money. It says, this is... A principle, whatever I use wisely, God will give me more of. You are a manager of that talent. The biblical word is steward, right? You're a steward or a manager of that talent. It's not yours. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust, who have been entrusted with something, with that talent, must, be prove, must prove faithful. I'm telling you, it's a test. It's a test. God's going, let me give her this talent, see what she does with that. So let, me, let, me give him, let me give him this. Let me make him better at this and see what he does. Is he going to make himself money? Is he going to prop himself up? Or is he going to bless others with that? 
It's a test. Those talents that God has given you is a test. It's a divine setup. And there are, there are two great themes all throughout the Bible. From cover to cover, from Genesis to, to Revelation, this is the, the theology. The two great themes of the Bible are salvation and stewardship. That's the two great themes. Salvation is, have I given my life to Jesus? Has he forgiven me and I given my life to Jesus? Stewardship is, what are you doing with what you've been given? And God is looking at both of those things. He's watching. He's looking. He's testing those things. You're a manager of the talent you've been given. I'm just trying to help you this time, church, this time, to, be pr- to show yourself faithful, not fickle. That this time, man, when, when the test comes, you'll recognize it for what it is. You're not going to retreat back. You're not going to give up. You're not going to throw in the towel. But God uses the little things to test my integrity. He uses my talents to test my unselfishness. Here's the third thing. God uses shortages to test my generosity. Shortages. Faithful people are generous even when they don't have it. It's easy to be generous when I have a surplus. Anyone can be generous when you have a surplus. When I got enough time, you know, when I, and I can be generous with my time when I got a lot of time. I can be generous with my energy when I got enough energy. I, I can be generous with my money when I got enough money, when I got extra money to spend. I can be generous with my help when I got uh, extra help to give after I've helped myself. It's when I don't have enough time. It's when I don't have enough energy. It's when I don't have enough money. That's when faithfulness is tested. That's, it's in the shortages. That's a, I'm telling you, it's, it's a test. If it ain't already here, it's coming, church. Those shortages, that shortage is a test of your generosity. A great example of this is um, from the story of the church in Macedonia. Macedonia was in Greek in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, in Greece, there's two main churches. Paul planted both these churches. They're like spreading rapidly. And he's writing to the Corinth- Corinthian church, and he's bragging about their, their neighbors, the Macedonian churches. Check it out. He says, our friends, we want you to know what God's, uh, what God's grace has accomplished in the churches in Macedonia. See, they've, they've been severely tested by the troubles. Man, they, they were, but they recognize the test. They recognize the setup. But because their joy, they chose joy in the middle of it. But their joy was so great that they were extremely generous in their giving, even though they were very poor. You see, out of their poverty, they were being faithful. Do you know what the number one test of your faith is? The acid test of your faith is your finances. It is. It is. That's the number one test. You want to know why? It's because what you spend most of your time thinking about how am I going to use it, spend it, invest it, waste it, you know, play. you spend most of your time. That's why it is the acid test. How you, how you manage, how you steward your finances is the acid test of faith. Jesus said it this way in Luke 16. He said, I tell you, use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends for eternity. In this way, your generosity stores up rewards for you in heaven. But if you are, here's that word again, unfaithful with your worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven because you can't serve God and money? Did you know that God says, I use money as a test to see how well I can trust you in heaven? That's what that just said right now, that God uses money as a test to see how much you can be trusted. It's a test. That shortage that you're experiencing is a test. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a setup. And I want you, you guys, I want you blessed financially. I do. Um, it's, if you have a trouble in this area, like if you're in debt or maybe this is a difficult area of you and you want to be blessed by God, let me give you some extra notes. I'm going to give you four principles. They're not even in your notes. Let me rattle off some principles just to help you out. You may want to take some notes if you want to be blessed by God in this area of your life. Number one, God gives to generous people. You just got to kind of recognize that, that, that he's, he doesn't give to stingy people. He doesn't give to those who withhold. He actually says, hey, let's see who can outdo each other. You give, I give. You give, I give. Okay? And why does he do that? You ever think about that? Why does God want me to be generous? He doesn't need anything. You know why he wants you to be generous? Because he wants you to be like him. He wants you to take on his nature, his character. Our God is a generous God. The heart that is beating in your chest right now is because of God's generosity. 
The air that you are breathing right now is because of God's generosity. God gives to generous people. Here's the second principle. Obeying God's vision will bring God's provision. Don't get that mixed up either. Because a lot of us wait for the provision before we step out in faith and obey God in the vision he's given us. No, no, no. You don't, wait for the, you don't wait for the provision. You wait on the vision. And when the vision comes, you step out in faith, and God says, I will provide. So you respond to the vision. You don't wait for the provision. What he's giving you the vision for, he will give you the provision for, which leads to this third principle, that when I do what God tells me to do, he does what I can't do. When I do what God tells me to do, he does what I can't do. Like in, this, in the story we read at the beginning of the feeding of 5,000 in John chapter 6, you guys remember the story? They find the boy with the, the loaves of, of uh, bread and a few fishes, and they come and bring that to Jesus, and Jesus prays over it, blesses it, breaks it, and multiplies it to feed the 5,000 people and 12 bushel full left over. God is saying I need to expand your thinking. Just do what I'm telling you to do and just watch what I can do with your faithfulness. Just do what, what I'm telling you to do and I will do what you can't do. Here's the last truth about that is there's always a delay between sowing and reaping. There's always a delay between sowing and reaping. If I go out and I sow a seed, a kernel of like corn, you know, tomorrow and I go the next day and I, I'm not going to find ears growing on that thing yet, right? Because there is a time, there's a season between planting and harvesting, between seed and fruit. Always a delay. There's a delay. And what is God doing in a delay? Setting you up. That's what he's doing. He's testing you. I promise you. Some of you have started some things. You've taken some next steps. You've, you've, taken, you, you've made some new commitments. And, and here shortly, you're going to start looking for some fruit in that. You're going you're gonna to start looking back going, hey, when's the payout? When's the breakthrough? When is this? I promise you, please listen, it's a test. It's a, it's a divine setup. Will you be faithful in the delay? It's a setup, church, and I want you to start seeing it differently, that God uses the shortages to test your generosity. Will you continue to serve? Will you continue to give? Will you continue to be faithful in the shortages? It's a test. Here's the last one. That God uses tough times to test my persistence. God uses tough times to test my persistence. I learned this one. Probably the, the, this principle is, is the greatest learning I had from, was from a theologian, one of the wisest theologians ever born, Forrest Gump. You know, isn't that, come on, somebody, isn't that a wise, I don't care what you say, that's a wise man right there. That whole movie is a proverb, dude. You guys remember the, in the part of the story where the storm was coming and you got Bubba Gump fishing company out there and all the other shrimping boats, they, they say, you know what, the storm's coming, it's all over the news, it's going to be a bad storm, hurricane type, and they say, you know what, let's play it safe. Let's go, let's, let's go tie up to the harbor and lay down anchor and, 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 Let's, let's not do what shrimping boats were made to do. Let's go play it safe. Oh, it's a tough, it's a tough time. Let's go play it safe. Let's go. And there was only one boat, Forrest Gump's boat, the Bubba Gump Shrimping Co. boat out there doing what shrimping boats are supposed to do in the middle of the storm. They were, it was catching shrimp. It was fishing is what it was doing. And after that storm, you guys remember this, all the, all the boats that were at the harbor were dashed against, destroyed against the rocks dominated by the storm. And, and Forrest Gump dominated the market after that because he was the only one that was doing what shrimping boats were meant to do in the middle of the storm. You see, there's a tough time coming in your life where you are going to have an opportunity to say, yeah, I'll play it safe. I'll peel it back. I'm gonna, let me lay up anchor here in the harbor. I'm telling you, it's a test. It's a setup of your faithfulness. Will you quit? Will you lay off? Will you stop doing what God has called you to do in, this, in the tough times? Or will you be faithful and recognize it as a test of God? This is why, by the way, Discovery needs to continue to do what God has called the church to do. No matter the season, no matter the trial, no matter what comes, we need to be about reaching people, raising disciples, planting churches, feeding the hungry. Come on, somebody. We need to be doing what churches are meant to do, no matter what. God uses tough times to test my persistence. 
the difference between faithful and unfaithful people is that unfaithful people give up at the first sign of difficulty. Faithful people keep on keeping on. Faithful people are persistent. Faithful people are diligent. Faithful people are determined. Faithful people don't have an I quit. They're faithful. A lot of you know my testimony. I've shared it here recently too in in the How to Hear God's Voice series about when God spoke to me about discovery and just gave me that impression, a vision, and a word. But a lot of you don't know what preceded that season. Some might. But what preceded that vision? That word from God was the most difficult season of my entire life. Emotionally, even. Spiritually and emotionally. Um, I used to, before this season, I used to look at people that suffer with depression, even anxiety and stuff like that, like like a, come on, let's trust God kind of thing. Come on, man. Just put your faith in God. And I didn't understand the just the difficulty that that, that battle really is until this season. The depression hit me. I was under a attack, man. My family was under attack. My wife was under attack. It was such a difficult season. In that season, I, I wanted to give up. I was looking for, I was jumped, full, I was in full-time ministry, but I wanted to give me another job. Let me go back to the Navy. I'll go back to the military. I just looking because it was so hard. But in the middle of that season, my wife and I decided to go into a season of prayer and fasting. And it was in the middle of that prayer and fasting season that out here in traffic, that God spoke to me and said, you're going to plant a church in Southwest Bakersfield. What, what, that God birthed out of the, the toughest season of my life, he birthed a vision of discovery. I can't imagine what, what would have happened if I, if I chose to give up or retreat or to peel it back or to, if I didn't remain faithful in that tough season. It was a test. And God has divine setups for every one of you. He's testing. In the tough season, he's testing your persistence. Maybe you're in a tough season. Let me give you a few scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says, This is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, and it felt like that for me. And maybe, maybe you might be in a season where it feels like sometimes you're just dying. God says, hey, even though your body is dying inwardly, your spirit, that's mine. That's mine. Your your inner man is mine. Your spirit is mine. I'm going to renew that thing day by day. Your spirit will be renewed every day. For our present troubles are quite small, and they won't last very long. But but it's a test. You see, it's, it's going to produce something. I, I want to I accelerate your growth. I want to expand your thinking. The present trouble will produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last not just here on earth, but will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see right now. We don't get caught up in the struggle. Rather, we look forward like beyond it to what we have not seen for our troubles will soon be over, but the joys that will come will last forever. That problem that you're facing right now is a test. It's a setup. And and, and whereas in the past you retreated and you gave up, maybe in the past you peeled back or you played it safe. Maybe in the past you stopped responding to the vision of God because the provision wasn't there. Maybe in the past you gave up on that relationship or you gave up on that job or you gave up on that endeavor. Maybe in the past you you peeled it back, but this time, church, we're going to recognize it for what it is, and we're going to be faithful, because God wants to accelerate your growth, and he wants to expand your thinking. Let me leave you with this scripture. It's not even, it's not in your notes. I just want you to receive it, if you, especially if you're going through it. If you're in a tough time, you're in a tough season, maybe emotionally even could be like, like I had experienced. Maybe you're in an emotional tough season. Maybe it's a spiritual one or a relational one or a vocational one. I don't know what, what we receive this. Galatians 6, 9 says, don't get tired of doing what's right. Come on, church. Don't, don't get tired of being faithful. It's a good thing. You started a good thing. You, start, you started a new commitment. You took some next steps. Hey, don't get tired of being faithful, doing that good thing that God has called you to do because you'll be rewarded when the time is right. If, say it out loud, if you don't give up. Don't give up. That's it.
faithfulness.